I want to talk to you this morning about sacred places. Sacred places. And there's the picture of the Bankstons that we were looking for earlier. And we do honor them and thank them for helping to start those three churches. And uh, we're honored by the fact that Bobby could be with us this morning and to represent that family who was such a blessing to this church. And uh, uh, I know that uh, he and his brother and Brother Bankston and a lot of folks were very involved in building that building over there, literally with their hands and with their backs and uh, doing so much work. And through the years, this church has been a church who, if we didn't have the money, we had the grit and the determination and the willingness to work hard enough to get it done. And uh, uh, I, I remember a lot of days working to exhaustion to see God uh, be able to bring about what you see here as Southside Assembly of God. Growing up as a teenager, uh, I spent a lot of time with my father working on the church property. Uh, I, I, tell, I joke all the time, the day I turned 15, we were working on um, doing some remodeling at the church here. And the day I turned 15, my dad took me over here next to the old, what used to be Heinz Hospital and got my driver's license. And I, th I was so excited. I said, dad, that's cool. I mean, the day I turned 15, I got my driver's license. He handed me the keys to an old 55 Ford pickup that the church had. I went to the dump six times that day. I loaded that truck and took it to the dump six times that day. At the end of the day, I was exhausted. He looked at me and said, what, do you think I got your license for you to play around? <laughs> but anyway, turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 15. And I want to share the experience of Jacob. Now, Jacob is running from Esau. He's running from Esau. He is deceived. He is tricked. He is manipulated. He has stolen the birthright and the blessing. And Esau has sworn that he's going to kill him. And Jacob is fleeing. And as he flees from, uh, from, uh, from Esau, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran, which is their old stomping ground, their old home. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. Here in this moment, God revealed himself to Jacob. Notice he said, I am the Lord God of your father Abraham. And the God of Isaac. But Jacob, Jacob had still not come to that personal place of covenant with God. We go on and it says, the next slide, he said, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring and I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. You see, he revealed himself to him and also he began to speak into his life. For many of us, this is a sacred place where we met the Lord, where he was revealed to us. Not only was he revealed to us, but God began to speak into our life. Now we go on in verse 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. There are many people who have come through the doors of this church believing that there was a God but not having ever really experienced the personal presence of the Holy Spirit upon their life. And here in this place, they discovered that God is not only real, but he's real to me and he's alive and he's living in our hearts because his Holy Spirit is born witness with that and in our spirits that we are the sons of God. So he suddenly became aware, more aware of the fact of who God was. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. 
Bethel is house of God. We go on down to verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you gave me and all you give me, I will give you a tenth, God. So now he begins to covenant with God. And many of us came to that encounter with God where we first met him. Then God began to speak into our life. Then God began to move in our lives. And then we began that process of covenant relationship with God where he becomes our God. And God took him through a process of years on the backside of the wilderness. And years later, he is returning. Many years later, he's been, he's been and he's returned. You remember he said, if you will take me there and bring me back, you will be my God. And God takes us through a journey sometimes, doesn't he? Many of us have been through that spiritual journey here in this congregation. And we come in and we know we've met God. We've had an encounter with God. God spoke into our hearts. We've even said, God, I, I really believe in you. And if you'll just reveal yourself to me and show yourself to be faithful, I really want to go to this deeper level. And God takes us through that process of revealing himself. But then he comes to this point where something else transpires. And we pick up in chapter 35, years later, when he's returning to face, uh, and he has faced Esau and God then begins to speak to him. He's faced, you see, when he faced Esau, he was facing himself. He was facing his deceit, his lies, and, and all that he was. He had faced himself. He had faced the reality of who he was. He had wrestled with God. He had dealt with Esau. And now God, you know what God does? God takes him back to Bethel. Let's go in chapter 35 and verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answers me in the day of my, who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. You go on down to verse 6. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Back to the place where he met God. Back to the place where God revealed himself. Back to the place where God spoke into his life. Back to where God could do a work within him because this is what finally happened. Down in verses nine and 10, Jacob returned from Padam Aram. God appeared to him again and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be called Israel. So he named him Israel, which means prince with God. He, from usurper and deceiver and liar to the name prince with God. You see, God not only has revealed himself, God not only has spoken to our, uh, into our lives, God not only has, has, has taken us through this journey of revelation, but there comes that time and that place where we honor him and we lift him up and we exalt him and we worship him. And here is that place where we have chosen to do that. And then God does this amazing thing. He changes our name. He gives us a new name. He gives us a new identity. He calls us his. And that's what this is, being part of the body of Christ. Where we have come and God has taken us from death into life. God has taken us from our old way and our old life into a new life in Christ Jesus. I mean, all of our guys who are in Mercy House, it's such a wonderful and incredible celebration where God takes someone that, that the, the, everybody's done with, the world is done with, everyone is tired of, and then God takes them and he tells them, I'm still with you, I've never left you. And he speaks into their life and he transforms them and he gives them a new life. And not only the men in Mercy House, but so many of this congregation, the things that we used to be, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, all the things we used to be. But God brought us out of that and God changed us and God transformed us. 
I look at Spencer and so proud of where God has taken him and he's studying to get his credentials with the Assemblies of God. And I remember when I first, first met him, I wouldn't have given a whole lot of chance of that happening. But you know, God is taking him down that journey. God is taking him to that place of covenant. God is taking him to that place of change where he is changing and transforming him. And he says, I feel the call of God upon my life to be a pastor. No one sees the miracle in that. God has called, laid his hand on me to be a pastor and he's gonna make a good one because you know what he's doing? He's teaching him how to love, how to love his sheep. And so God has taken some of us through some tremendous journeys and times, but not only does he take us to covenant, he takes us through that change where he changes our name. Sacred places. Next slide. Or where heaven and earth meet for a moment and the veil between is drawn back for a brief glimpse of what is beyond. In those moments comes a shift in perspectives and adjustment of priorities and a realization of possibilities. These times move us from a focus on what has been to what can and will be if we'll allow God to move in our lives. The next slide, in this place we've encountered God. We've met our mates, birthed babies and dreams, buried burdens and hurts, found freedom, been redeemed and delivered, called and commissioned. We fought hell and seen heaven. There have been a multitude enter the kingdom of God through this place and generations have transitioned from faith to fact as the torch passed from their hands to ours and they slipped from our sight into God's eternal embrace. Miss Gertrude was the last of that great generation. I know they're still... Bobby and Eddie, but they were teenagers at the time. But that senior, that, that adult generation, they have passed on and they've gone on to their reward in heaven. But God has raised up other generations as they have slipped. A whole generation has passed away. They're gone, but this place remains. You see, the beauty of those sacred places is God can bring you back to those places. God can bring your children and even your grandchildren. You see, when they crossed the Jordan River, they took some of the stones and they piled them there and they made a monument unto God and it was a sacred place so that when the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren came by, there were those stones that are reminding them, this is where God brought us out of the wilderness and into the promised land. This place stands here as a sacred place where so many people's lives have been transitioned. Folks, I want you to know, though this place be but wood, dirt, stone, it is as the altars raised of old a tribute to all that God has done and a declaration of all that he intends to do through the sweat and sacrifice of many, this place rose from the ground as a witness to the workings of our God and stands its ground on this hill as a beacon of his light amid surrounding darkness. That's what God is doing. That's that next slide. And then finally I go here. May this place remind us of all that God has done in our lives and help others to discover all that God can do in theirs. On to that next slide. Guys, I'm sorry, but our clicker's not working today for some reason. This place is to be a testimony to both us and future generations that he is a God of covenant to a thousand generations. The Bible says that he visits the sins of the fathers to the second and third generation, but his promises, this is God. This is how I love God. I, I love the, the beauty of God. Our sins are so great, but his grace is so much greater. And it says that the sins of the fathers are visited on the second and third generations, but his promises are to a thousand generations. I know that many of the blessings that, that I have enjoyed in my life are because God is a God of generational covenant Amen. and passed down from the generations to me the blessings that our sons have enjoyed and our grandchildren are now enjoying is because God is a God of generations and to a thousand generations. You see, he said, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob and on and on and on and on for a thousand generations. Bobby, I know that many of the blessings you've enjoyed in your life is because you had a mom and dad who served God and that was a generational blessing that passed down upon you. Many of the others here that are in this church, 
You're being blessed because God is a God of covenant and that covenant crosses over the lines of generations. May this place remind us that he is faithful, what he has done in our lives. This place is to be a testimony to both us and the future generations that he is a God of covenant to a thousand generations. He brought Israel, the man, and the nation in and brought them back. And that is who he is. And that is what he does. Not only the man Israel did he take him to a foreign land and bring him back safe. But the nation he dispersed throughout the earth because of judgment of their sins. And he said, but I will bring you back. And after 1800 years without a land, suddenly in 1948, God brought the nation of Israel back to the land because that's who God is. So if you're a grandparent or a parent and you've got a wayward child and you've, you're wondering about the blessings of God, you hang in there and you hold on because God is a God of generational blessings and he will pour out his spirit. And I want this to be a place that continues to stand and say, God is still faithful and that God may have blessed your, your grandparents and your parents, but God can bless you too because he's a God of covenant and he is faithful to his covenant. He said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, but I'll see you to the land and back from the land. And, and I'm, I'm so grateful. As I sit and I look across this congregation, there are several sons that went off in that foreign land, but you know what? God brought them back. There are several daughters who've got off in that foreign land, but thank God he brought them back. And even though our sin may bring judgment, his promises and his covenant can bring blessings upon our life. So you keep praying over those kids and you keep believing over them and those grandkids because God is a God of covenant. He is so faithful. As we begin to wrap this up, it is imperative that we remember that what these stones represent, that next slide. This is where he brought us in. For some, it is where he brought us back from a wandering away. This is for many of us the place of our res rescue story. Here in this place, God parted the water, pulled back the veil and let us catch a glimpse of what is beyond. We long for you of the younger generation to know why these stones are here. This is one of the reasons we always reminisce and we remember because we don't want to forget that go what God has brought us through. It was to remind us of the promise he fulfilled to us and one he has made to you as well because you are sons and daughters of the covenant. And don't forget it. The blessings that God has poured out upon the generations before you, he desires to pour out upon you. And our job is not done until we hand to the next generation that flame and fire of his anointing and his spirit to place upon you to let you know that God is that God of faithfulness. The greatest testament and monument to God, however, is his eternal temple that consists, next slide, of living stones. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, meaning Jesus Christ, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Through Jesus Christ. Paul even wrote at one place, he said, you are our epistles known and read of men. You see, we are the greatest testimony that God has. And even though this building may stand here and it may be here for generations to come, the sad part is that if the living stones inside don't lift up the name of Jesus, it, it can become nothing but a museum of the past. I talked with our missionary to France. France, of course, having gone through the great enlightenment as our musicians come this morning. France having gone through the great enlightenment to the French Revolution, they kind of, when you mention God now, he said, most Frenchmen will look at you and say, that's great, but we've moved on beyond God. And all of those wonderful, incredible church buildings that are there in France are most of them just museums to what once was. You know what happened? Even though the physical stones were dedicated to God, the living stones inside did not remain so. We have to remember that this is all about a dedication and a covenant to the Lord Jesus, with the Lord Jesus Christ and with God the Father. And that's what this is about more than anything else. And all our hope is in Jesus and nothing else. There is no other hope 
It's not in this building. It's not in the materials that this building is built out of. It's in the God that it is dedicated to honor. That is where our strength, that is what our, where our hope is, is in Christ Jesus alone. And he alone is where our hope is. For those of you who have had experiences in God, I'd like you to begin to move to those places right now. Go to that last slide if you would. This is a sacred place. It's a sacred place, not because of what it's made of, but because what's been made in this place. If God has done a particularly special and unique work in your life, I want you to move to that place where he did that. Some of you may be around an altar. Now, surely someone has a testimony. Normally, we've got a whole bunch of people, but I guess you, you know you might get asked to say something this morning. But God has done something special in your place, in, in this place, in your life. I want you to understand that's what makes this a sacred place. There were all kinds of stones out there in the wilderness. There were all kinds of stones out there. But that stone... That stone was where he met God. That stone was where he encountered God. He understood God. He made covenant with God. And that's what made it sacred. So as we go around, some of these people are going to share for just a second. What did God do to make this place sacred? Mr. Dolores? Oh, wow. The building wasn't even here. I was carried in the spirit 44 years ago to this hill. And God showed me that that was going to be something that was going on and going to be great here. And I didn't think nothing else of it. My husband and I went and pastored in Shelby, came back, and God kept telling me about this place, this place, this corner, yes, on this hill. And God has just kind of put me in Southside, even though I wasn't in Southside, wasn't a member at that time of Southside. Everything was just coming together. And this place wasn't here, but look at it now. Look at what God has done. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. What makes this sacred to you? Well, he took everything. Um, that I'd been holding on to. And he cleaned me up. <laughs> Made me a new man. Amen. Totally changed my life. Amen. Amen. Right. You all know I cry. It's tears of you. Because when I came to this church, this policeman, I was back there, and this policeman told me, he said, come, come. he told me to come to this church. And they had came to my house that day, because my son, he tried to kill himself. And it was like angels all around the house. And they told me, he said, go to this church. I came to this church, and he said, because, he could get some help there. And so when I came, because he had cut both of, both of his wrists, and then one time he was trying, you know, I was going to take him to the hospital, but the ambulance came, the police came, and the fire truck came. And it was just like peace all around my house. And they said, we tell him we ain't going to hurt you. We're just trying to help you. But when I came, and then I had started visiting this church ever since I can remember how many years. But I thank God for this church. And I remember it was a lady. She had. I don't know her name. But she came and she prayed with me and everything. And But I thank God for Pastor Wilson and everyone that is here and the one that's gone now. And, you know, it's nobody but God, and I'm still here today because I just love Pastor Wilson and his wife because they be trying to help everybody, 
any kind of way they can. But I just thank God for them. God put them here for a reason. Because he, he had been there and talked to my son. And he done been in Mercy House before. But I thank God because he done been shot and this all kind of thing that happened to him in the, in the hospital. But you know what? He's still here. And I thank God that he's still here because it's, no, it's not me. It's God. And I thank God for giving me strength to keep praying. Amen. And I love you. Amen. God's restoring him. <laughs> Amen. Brother Jane. Thank you, Pastor. This is not the actual spot. The spot's over there right in front of that door. This is not my spot, but this is where I first completed Teen Challenge. It's the first thing I ever completed in my life. My spot's over there right inside the door. We're going, when we go over to the dining hall, it's right outside that door. That's where Miss Regina laid hands on me and prayed for me. My life's been forever changed. But this is the spot where I graduated, so I just want to share that with y'all. Amen. I just want to thank you so much. Um, ten months ago, on the first, I got my transplants. I didn't know I was going to need two until the you know toward the last minutes, but. In, for those that don't know, I had a liver and a kidney transplant 10 months ago. And I just wanted to thank my family Amen. for praying for me. Because I never knew the power of prayer, the true power of prayer, until I woke up. And I knew it was because of you. It was because of your prayers, and you didn't give up, because it took a long time to get that transplant. So y'all have been praying for me for years, <laughs> and I just want to thank you for not giving up, because God is so good. He is so good, and he loves me too. <laughs> I guess through this, he's really shown me how much he loves me, and I just can't believe y'all stood by me. <laughs> and I just wanted to thank you. And it, that's not enough. But I'll pray for you too. <laughs> when you ask, I will pray and not stop until we've got the answer. I love you. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm just going to say this is one of many places in this church where God has touched me and changed my life. <laughs> but this particular spot is where he broke the generational curse of depression over my life and my children. And that is such a crazy miracle because we have all been sucked into depression as far back as... I can remember we've had two people that have committed suicide. My The drug and alcohol addiction in my family, I can't even number it. There's so much. Uh, but that particular curse is broken in my family. Amen. Thank the Lord. Hey, how you doing, South Side? Um, Jeremiah 29, 11, and say, um, <clears throat> for I know the plan that I have for you, and declare the Lord plans to promise you. Not to harm you, but to give you a fruit and a hope. So uh, every time that I used to get tired of being out there in that world, I used to run to the you know the church right here, and that was my time. But actually, it was God's time. So I I came right here and I said a prayer I never forget. I said a prayer, and that following week it came true. So God, He was letting me know, you know, the whole time that it was His doing and not mine. So. That's uh, what I enjoy to come in to this church. Pastor Wills and his wife, Lynette, you know, it's just family, it's just love. And it's like I said before, it's the truth. So, you know, um, God, he, he, he is alive and real in this, in this house here. Amen. 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 Amen.
Praise the Lord. And I want to tell you, thank you for keeping on loving him until God could get it done. <laughs> uh, she's in my spot, but I'll let her stand there anyway. <laughs> uh, I got saved in 07, uh, around the 19th and 20th. My wife and I, we were like 17, and uh, we... But, I mean, we got high with both of our parents. I mean, we grew up doing that. That's just kind of the way of life. But I had my grandmother, Dolores, and so she paid us to go to the ramp. <laughs> like 200 bucks, 17, you were like, that's a lot of money. <laughs> she really didn't pay us. She just gave us the money to survive on out there. But I backslid six months later, you know, because of, you know, pride. It's just how it works. <laughs> You're going to fall. <laughs> so I remember a Friday night, you know, just getting high and crying at the same time because this time I knew it was wrong. I had that conviction and I come through and um, that was a Friday, Saturday and Sunday. I woke up really mad. I was mad. I remember I was trying to, you know, fix it up, whatever you want to call it. And I remember I got in the car with my grandmother or, and I came through and I remember who Pastor Art was uh, doing a service here. Y'all don't know him, but he, he was cool. I remember opening that door and coming straight down here and that was six months later, so you do the math. And I remember Caleb Richardson come up, and I was just like, well, I was snotting my head off, actually, like right here. And I was like, Jesus, I really need freedom. I mean, I, I, everybody's like, you're going to have to work for it this time. And I was like, I don't believe that. I believe it can be instant. Just like that, it can happen again for the first, second time. So Caleb comes up, and I thought he was just rambling. And he was like, Lord, he's free now. But he didn't even know what was going on. He didn't even know I'd backslid because I kept showing my face. And... Uh, I remember he was like, he's free, and I was like, what? You know, I didn't even know he was, like, saying it, but I remember, so that would have been right after July-ish, you know, into the winter or whatever. I remember it was the last time I ever got high ever again was that Sunday morning, and I remember going the whole week later and going, waiting for that desire to come back, but it, it hasn't been back since, so. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thanks, Pastor. Uh, in 2010, I came into Mercy House um, from Hattiesburg, and I was strung out pretty bad. And uh, this church was the very, very first church that I'd ever been to. And when I came in here, right back there, the, uh, the people here accepted me in, that dirty little junkie from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and loved on me like I had never, ever seen before in my life. God became real to me then, like I, I can't even explain it. When I graduated, I stayed sober a few years. It's no secret, I relapsed. And I kept, I knew what I needed to do. God kept talking to me, and he told me one day, even in my addiction again, he was like, I'm going to bring you home. He was like, I'm going to bring you home. So I'm sitting around one day, and he was like, go back to where it started. And I said, okay, where did it start? I called Brother David, and uh, Brother David was like, man, I've been waiting on you. I've been waiting on you because I was like, I, I got to get some help. You know, it's going downhill, and it's going downhill real fast. I'm going to die out here. And Brother David, Pastor Wilson, and, of course, all you guys brought me right back in and, uh, and started loving on me again. When I was down here one day, I thought that what he meant, go back to where it started, was Mercy House. Well, what it actually was when I was down here praying one day, he was like, this is where it started, and this is where I'm going to finish it. And that's why I'm always down here jumping around and acting crazy, because God touched me right here so hard one day. I know my life will never be the same again. Thank you. Amen. I've shared this before from the platform, but every year when Pastor does this, I think of this one spot. And recently I shared with Lynette, Howard and I were gone one weekend, and she sent us a sweet message on Monday and told us she had missed us. Last year when we were gone, every Sunday we were in a different church across Mississippi as the directors at Teen Challenge, and we worshiped, and we worshiped well. But every Sunday I remembered thinking, there is no place like home. There's no place like worshiping in this sanctuary and I didn't know that growing up. I didn't know what freedom meant to worship. But one Sunday, under Lynette's tutelage, we were up here singing, and I was praising, and I looked to the sky, to the top of the roof, and I remembered the, the building literally opened up, and I saw God's face shining, 
and smiling down on us, and he said, I love you. And I knew that he was talking about all of us, not just me, but about the worship that we show him every week, week in and week out. You feel it here. It is palpable to your body when you walk in this door to feel the praise that comes out of this sanctuary, and I'm so blessed to be part of it. Thank you. Amen. One last one, then we'll close with a hymn. It was 16 years ago when I came to this church. I changed my life. I was sitting right down there at the bar. It used to be the Ramada Inn. And I told my friends at the bar, I said, this is my last time to ever, ever come inside of a bar and drink. And they said, wow, what was going on? I said, I have something inside of me aching, and I can't figure out what it is. So I left early, came home, and I was raised Baptist, so I stopped going to seven different Baptist churches, couldn't figure out where God wanted to lead me. So I shut my eyes one Sunday morning, this before we had cell phones, looked under yellow pages, under churches, and I shut my eye, and I said, God, you tell me where you want me to go. So I pointed, and it was Sasa Assembly of God. And I went, okay, never been to this type of church before, but I'll go. Got dressed, rent, which I said, I think right back down there, Helen and Rose were sitting right in front of me. You came out, started singing, and I touched Rose, and I, of course, I didn't know her name at the time. And I asked her, I said, who is that singing? They, she said, that's our pastor of our church. I went, oh my gosh, he's awesome. They said, well, if you like his singing, you'll love his preaching. <laughs> and I have every sense. But when I walked in these doors right over here and walked in the sanctuary, the Holy Spirit just hit me. I couldn't figure out what it was. Something just came across me. And this is, I, God spoke to me then, that day, he said, welcome home. You're at home now. And it's like blindfolders. I kept telling my friends. My friends started coming to church. They noticed the change in me. It's like a horse race when you got blindfolders on. We were sitting there listening to the pastor preach, and he was saying to this the choir to come up, start singing about the end. And we kept saying, no, no, we can stay all day. Listen to you preach. You are so awesome. And God has really, really blessed you. And Lynette, love y'all so much. Thank you.